So today we're talking about electron beam lithography. This is a technique that's used to basically write small patterns into a resist, very similar to photolithography that we've looked at in the past. The difference is that instead of using photons or light to do the lithography, we're using electrons, specifically a beam of electrons from a scanning electron microscope. E-beam litho is a really cool technique because in many ways it mirrors photolithography. It's the same general principle of exposing a resist and then developing it to form some type of positive or negative pattern, which then you can use further down the line with different processes. But it also is just considerably different, right? So first off, we're using electrons instead of photons, which means the chemistry of the resists that we're developing are entirely different. The resolution of a lithographic process is dependent on the wavelength of whatever you're using. So if you're using photons, it's the wavelength of the photon, which is why lithography has moved further and further into the ultraviolet or extreme ultraviolet range over time. In contrast, electrons have a wavelength anywhere from 2 to, say, 10 picometers. So picometers, not nanometers, an order of magnitude smaller wavelength. And that means an e-beam process can give you just incredibly high resolution, which can't really be matched by photons at all. The big downside to electron beam lithography is that it's a direct write process. So it's similar to the laser lithography project that I did a while back where you're basically rastering a beam of electrons across the resist to form the image. For that reason, e-beam lithography is mostly only seen in labs and other kind of research institutions uh, where you don't really care about the throughput of your process, you just want really fine resolution. Now I'm using my scanning electron microscope as an improvised electron beam lithography machine. And this is actually a time-honored tradition SEMs have been converted into kind of litho machines for basically as long as SEMs have been around. It's a really common technique to take an old machine or maybe an unused machine and convert it into something you can use to write patterns with. There are some downsides to using SEM in this manner. We'll talk about some of those kind of pros and cons later, uh, but it's not ideal, although it does get the job done. If you're at a professional institute that does a lot of this kind of work, you'll probably have a dedicated EBL or electron beam lithography machine and the advantage of this is basically they're a lot bigger They have much better control of the electron beam They have higher accelerating voltages and you can basically get much better patterns a lot faster than you can with an SEM So let's talk about the substrates first. I'm using a Doped silicon wafer. There are two main properties of this wafer that I'm interested in first It's very flat and secondly probably more importantly is it's a conductive wafer because it's been doped and so that means when you hit it with electrons, the electrons can very easily conduct through the material and then out to ground. If we use something like a glass slide, the problem is glass is an insulator. And so those electrons, when they hit the substrate, they'll bury themselves a little bit into the glass and then they don't have anywhere to go because there's no easy path to ground. So they'll kind of build up in the local area and you'll get a charging effect that starts to repel electrons where you're trying to write it. And so insulating substrates can be tricky to use in an EBL system for this charging reason. Typically, if you have an insulating substrate, you'll coat it with a very thin layer of metal before putting your resist, or you'll add your resist and then put a layer of metal on top. And this just basically provides a, an escape path for those electrons. The resist that I'm using is PMMA, polymethyl methacrylate or more commonly known by everybody as acrylic plastic. You take a source of acrylic. In my case, I'm using these injection molding resin beads. I'm using 5% acrylic dissolved in the anisole, and then you drop it onto the wafer on a spin coater, spin it out at a particular RPM to get the desired thickness. I'm running my spin coder at its max speed of 5,000 RPM, which gives me a surface layer of about 200 nanometers. PMMA is one of the kind of original classic resists for electron beam lithography. And one of the reasons for that is it's cheap and easy, but it also has a really wide process range. So you can dilute it down and spin it out to get a really thin layer, just tens or hundreds of nanometers, or you can build up really thick layers, a couple microns. And it's 
moderately sensitive, has decent contrast. It kind of is just in a sweet spot of being easy to work with and getting relatively good results. So that's what I stuck with, although there are a whole number of other types of resists that you could potentially use. After spinning the resist on, it's basically dry. Most of the solvent has evaporated, but to ensure that there's just absolutely nothing else on the wafer, you throw it on a hot plate for a couple minutes at 150, 160 degrees Celsius, and that will just flash off any of the remaining solvent. One really nice thing about e-beam resists is that they're not photosensitive, right? They're not photo resists, they're electron beam resists, which means you can just work with them out in the shop or the lab and you know, you don't need a dark room with safe lights or anything. But that brings up an interesting question. How are e-beam resists sensitive to electrons? There are generally two types of resists that you can run into. The first one is very similar to photosensitive resists where electron will strike a monomer, and then it starts kind of a chain reaction of polymerization. But a more common mechanism is known as polymer scission, where an electron will basically cut through a polymer chain and break it up. And so where you might have had a long chain of polymers before, electrons are basically dicing it up into smaller pieces. And these small chains of the polymer now become soluble in whatever you're developing with. Whereas the the polymer that is untouched by the electron remains insoluble. And that's predominantly how PMMA operates. If you hit it with electrons at a certain dosage, you will chop it up into small pieces and it becomes soluble in your developer of choice. So essentially we're gonna scan our electron beam in whatever pattern we want, and wherever that electron beam strikes the acrylic, it will chop up the long polymer chains into short little monomer chains and those short little chains will be easily dissolved in the IPA and wash away. So when we're done, we'll be left with acrylic everywhere except where the beam had struck it. And then we can use that for whatever processes we need, whether we're like depositing metal or etching or whatever. Now I wish I could show you the e-beam process. Unfortunately, there's just nothing to see. You put it inside the machine, it pumps down the vacuum and rasters away the pattern. My particular machine has a convenient Python API where you can command it to move to different locations, change the beam settings, raster out a pattern. So there's really just nothing to see. So the next step after pulling it out of the SEM is to develop it. I'm using ice cold 70% IPA and you develop for 30 to 45 seconds, give or take. Rinse it off in deionized water and if everything's gone well, you should have a pattern. I found using cold isopropyl alcohol to be absolutely required. If you use room temperature, it develops the whole wafer almost immediately and you tend to not get great results at all. Whereas if it's cold just from a fridge, four degrees Celsius, you've got a 30 to 60 second kind of range that you can work with before it starts to etch away everything. If you play your cards right and you don't overdevelop it, you can use the same wafer multiple times to run multiple tests, although it does get a little thinner each time, so be careful with that. A nice thing about this system is that the undeveloped acrylic is easily dissolved in acetone, so when you're done running a set of tests, you can just dunk the whole thing in acetone and then give it a nice clean, and you're back to a fresh wafer which you can start the process all over again. So these optical microscope images are from some of my first tests that were really starting to work consistently, although not particularly well. You can see there's a lot of issues with under and over exposure here, where parts of the pattern expose really nicely and you get good crisp lines, and then other parts get totally blown out and you don't have any definition at all. You can see that a lot of these patterns have issues with consistent exposure. There'll be parts of the pattern that are kind of in isolation or relatively coarse lines that expose well and have nice definition. And then other parts of the pattern that get washed away. So the whole region kind of just exposes as one big blob that develops and you don't get any of the individual features. This is due to an effect called the proximity effect. And we'll talk about it more later, but essentially electrons kind of scatter from where you're trying to expose and unintentionally develops a region around your pattern. So this tends to happen where you have very dense features, so lots of little lines next to each other, gets a lot of cumulative exposure and overdevelops.
as the patterns get smaller, this effect becomes more pronounced because again, you've got more features in a smaller area. So these initial tests, by the time you get to the smallest regions, the whole thing is basically exposed as a single blob and it's, it's unusable. I started to get a handle on this particular problem, which allowed me to push features considerably smaller. So I don't have a whole lot of good optical footage basically from this point on, because it's just kind of hard to see it under my not very expensive optical microscope. Kind of amusingly, it's hard to see under the SEM as well. The resist is just a polymer, so it doesn't really like being under the scanning electron microscope. It builds up charge, and there's just not a lot of contrast between the polymer and the silicon wafer. In some cases, you can see where it's overexposed a little bit and the features start to actually delaminate off of the wafer. The patterns that I'm working with are about 90 microns wide. So for reference, a human hair is anywhere from 50 to 80 microns. So this pattern that you're seeing could fit in its entirety on top of a human hair. If we pop some of my better samples under the atomic force microscope, we can start to really assess the, the features and how well they've developed the thickness of the resist, and the actual line width of some of these different features. So you can see that some of the finest features, the very thin parallel lines at the top of the pattern, are coming out to be about 100 nanometers, which is really wild to me that this is even remotely possible. This particular sample has a lot of what looks like particles or contamination. Uh, some of it is just dust and particulate from the air because I'm not working in a clean room. Some of it I have tracked down to actually being a byproduct of the development. I think it's the PMMA that I'm using is not fully dissolving away. And so you get these kind of uh, globules of semi-developed, but not entirely washed away acrylic. I won't bore you with the details. I spent a long time kind of debugging this particular problem and I'm 90% sure it's just the resist. So this should clear up by using a PMMA that's designed for lithography. They come in different molecular weights rather than just injection molding resin, which is what I'm using. A neat thing about this is that it's sort of dose dependent. So the more electrons you hit a particular region, the more the resist will get broken up and it works its way from the top down. Although plenty of electrons will just shoot straight through. And so what ends up happening is if you just expose a little bit in a region, kind of at the top bit of the resist will wash away and then you expose a little more and the next bit of the resist will wash away. So you can actually get different levels pretty controllably by just varying how much dose you give to each particular region. So these little test grids, you can see visually that they have different amounts etched away. And then if you check it under the AFM, you can see that they are in fact different heights, which is really cool. And it's neat how consistent and reliable this process is. So let's talk about all the many different parameters and ways that this can go wrong. From the top, you've got the resist thickness. So a thinner resist will give you better definition than a thicker resist because the electrons, when they're passing through the resist, they don't scatter as much. The substrate itself, as we mentioned earlier, can play a big part. The accelerating voltage is pretty directly proportional to your resolution. The higher the accelerating voltage, the less kind of dispersion of the electrons, they'll go deeper and scatter less. So I'm using the highest setting on my machine, which is 20 keV, but for perspective, industrial e-beam machines will use 100 or 200 keV. So like order of magnitude less than what I probably should be using. And the, the downside to this basically is that my electrons are penetrating not as deeply as a professional machine, which means they have more chance to kind of scatter around. And this is important because it contributes to what's known as a proximity effect in E-beam, where the electrons will pass through the resist and expose that region, but they get trapped in the substrate and then kind of bounce around for a little while and will come back out of the resist and essentially expose the resist a second time at a different location somewhere further away from where you want it to be. Industrially, there are fancy algorithms that will kind of calculate and compensate the dose at every single pixel based on this proximity effect. Because you can, in theory, you know, determine the dosage at each location and how much it's spreading to surrounding locations, and then go back and adjust that pixel accordingly. I don't have any of that software, so I kind of just did it by hand. You can see that my test pattern actually has grayscale values in different locations. And this is a way for me to adjust the dosage 
at that particular spot. And I kind of just went in by hand and added gradients where it felt correct and where I was seeing problems in my pattern. And this got me an okay result, but it's by no means scientific. Another important variable is emission current. So you can think of it like accelerating voltage is how fast you're throwing the electrons, whereas emission current is how many electrons are you throwing. This is important because you need enough electrons to develop a region in a reasonable amount of time, but the more current, the more electrons you throw at a particular spot, the more they repel each other. And so your spot size actually grows as you increase the emission current. So my machine is not designed for this. It's a scanning electron microscope. It takes pictures. And so there, the way this is being executed is kind of hacky. The first and easiest way to do it is Take your scan field of view, so what you'd normally scan an image with, shrink it down to a really small box, and then just move that box around and kind of chunk out pixel by pixel all the spots you're interested in. So this is what I tried at first, and it works, but it's really slow. The resolution is very limited because it can only reduce the field of view so much, and it overexposes the resist. I got talking to the folks at NanoScience and Thermo, and there's a new API on my machine that actually lets you raster out a bitmap. So you give it an image, you tell it how many microseconds to dwell at each pixel, and it will go out and raster that image, the pattern for you. So this is a huge improvement, but you still don't have a great control over timing. It's just rastering the pattern continuously. You can't say just run through the pattern once, which means you have to do it in a time-based manner where you say run for 10 seconds and then stop. And this is where a lot of the source of difficulty comes from, because it's a Python API talking to a backend, which then talks to the SEM machine itself, which then executes the commands, and then it responds back to the backend and then responds to the Python API. So through benchmarking, I found that this whole process has an overhead of, I don't know, 40 to 50 milliseconds, and it's a little variable. And when you're talking about you know, on the order of milliseconds or microseconds for exposure times, this is not at all what you want. So what I had to do is reduce my emission current and spot size down basically as low as the machine can go. It's almost turned off and let it raster a bunch of times over a particular location to build up the required dosage such that the exposure times were long enough that you could control it with just a sleep. So five to 10 to 60 seconds. The big downside to this is that because you're rastering many, many times, you'll often stop the raster in the middle of the image. The other big downside to using an SEM is what's known as the blanker. So big industrial EBL machines will have what's known as a fast beam blanker. And this is basically just a, an electromagnet at the top of the electron column that will quickly shunt the beam to the side. And the point of this is just to turn the beam off really quickly. And this lets you kind of go to a pixel, expose it, and then go to another pixel and expose it and have nothing exposed in between those two pixels because you've turned the beam off essentially. Uh, this is important because the electron source itself, you can't really turn it on and off quickly. It's a slow process. SEMs don't have fast beam blankers because they don't need that. They just have a normal blanker that kind of slowly turns the source off. And the downside to this means that if you're not careful, you can draw traces between pixels or between patterns. So if you look at some of my test patterns, you can see these little lines kind of snaking between the different tests. And this is where the beam was just left on as we move from one location to the next, and we've exposed kind of a track in between those locations. In theory, this is a problem in practice, Less so, because the parameters are all dialed down essentially as weak as possible, when the beam travels from A to B, it's only developing a little bit of that resist, and it's not enough to really cause a problem. So as long as you're not tracing the same path over and over and over, it doesn't really end up being a problem. Oh yeah, there's one other big issue with PMMA, and it's that it can turn from a positive resist to a negative resist. So under a certain threshold, it will act as a positive, meaning that the parts exposed to the electron beam will wash away and you're left with a hole in your resist. But actually, if you overexpose it, it will chop up all the little polymers and then it kind of like glues them back together because it's just being pounded with these electrons. And so you develop a region that's insoluble in the developer and it becomes a negative resist. So the spots that are exposed to it stay behind while everything else dissolves away. This image is actually a really good example of this phenomenon happening. 
you can see the region that I traced out, the pattern was overexposed, so it remained insoluble in the developer and stayed behind, but all the surrounding regions dissolved away in the developer because the proximity effect, all the kind of electrons that were bouncing around the pattern, exposed the resist just enough to kind of get to a normal exposure level. So it dissolved away while the pattern itself stayed behind. So yeah, the next steps are basically using this for some kind of project. I've got a couple ideas in mind. We'll see which works out. Um, I've started testing a few processes and it will be challenging to get this working. So the two main ways it's a whole big rabbit hole. We're not gonna go into it right now. Suffice to say, making the pattern is only the first challenge. Actually using the pattern for something is gonna be a challenge on its own. So we're punting that to a future project video. So some of you have probably noticed that I've been absent from YouTube lately. I haven't been putting out videos kind of at the regular cadence that I was before. Partially that was just for mental health. I need a break, I was kind of burning out for a while there. And partially I've been working on getting the shop set up, moving all my stuff in, get everything back organized and up and running. During my little YouTube sabbatical, I spent some time working on this, which is a kind of scale replica of Curiosity's rover wheel. So the Curiosity rover up on Mars had really interesting rover wheels that were kind of an evolution of prior rover wheels. So there's a lot of like really interesting technology built into these small wheels and I just, I don't know, I wanted one on my desk. And so I started working on this project with the wheel and the hub and the spokes. And it'll all kind of assemble together and I'll get everything anodized and it'll be a neat little project. Uh, including there's a JPL spelled out in Morse on the grousers across the wheel. It's just such a cool thing. I'll probably do a video on the tech of these wheels because the lineage of rover wheels is just a really interesting topic for kind of space nerds like myself. So I'm contemplating making a batch of these to sell. Uh, we'll see, I don't know if it's worth it or not, but they are really cool uh, just to kind of play with and hold in your hand. So that's what I've been doing with my time off. Well, I think that's all I got for you today. Big thanks to everyone that supports me on Patreon. I really appreciate it. If you like today's content or want to hear updates about the Rover Wheel, make sure you're subscribed to the channel. And otherwise, I think that's it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.